when somebody is mistreating you or somebody has shut you down, sometimes you got to ask who they be with. Who have they been connected to which has caused something to rise out of them that is not normal? Anybody ever send your kids away from the weekend and they came back different? I mean, I know some people came up in some divided households and single parent households and they went with a parent over the weekend and then came back calling you by your first name and snapping their neck and rolling their eyes. And you're like, who have you been with? Wherever you better go back where you came from and come back in the door. But to understand that sometimes it's the company. So Paul begins to minister. And when he says in verse 14, he said, be not unequally yoked to unbelievers. Now, where did that come in? He's first talking about you know, being offended and y'all ain't speaking to me and your, your heart is closed off to me. Then he says, don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Because people can corrupt your walk if you're not walking together. How can two walk together except they agree? One of the problems that's happening with the church is that we are creating yokes with unbelievers and yokes with pseudo-Christians and yokes with people who don't even know God. So when, you're, when you are unequally yoked, then your doctrine is off. Your word is off. Your worship is off because you are connected with something that's not like God. Yeah. Yeah. Paul said, don't be unequally yoked to unbelievers. Now, people of God understand this. Unequally yoked is not the same as association. Um, I believe that Paul went back to an Old Testament prohibition that comes out of Deuteronomy 22 and 10. Deuteronomy 22 and 10 says, Thou shalt not, pl uh, thou shalt not pl um, place an ox and an ass together. Some of y'all grew up old country. Everybody didn't have a tractor when you grew up. Some people know what a mule and a yoke, yoking two, two cows together, yoking two mules together. But the Bible says, don't put an ox and a mule together. Why? They have different personalities. They have different predilections. They're not going to agree with each other. They're two different species. You cannot fellowship. You don't see a lot of dogs and cats hanging out together. You don't see a lot of birds and squirrels walking down the street together. We're different species. And so when he says, don't be unequally yoked. You cannot put two things together that are not compatible. That's right. That's right. And there's a difference between a yoke and an association. I got unsaved co-workers, unsaved family, unsaved neighbors, unsaved childhood friends. I don't have to stay away from them. I just can't be yoked to them. You got family that you are bound by blood, but you can't be yoked together. Oh, and I got to explain the difference. See, some of y'all think just because y'all got the last name, y'all got the same destiny. That ain't the truth. There are some people that don't have your last name that you are closer to because spirit knits quicker than flesh. Just because somebody got your last name don't mean y'all got nothing in common. Y'all might have the same lips, the same nose, the same eyes, but we ain't got the same spirit. So he says, don't be yoked. Well, what is a yoke? A yoke is an apparatus that is put on animals that keeps them joined together. They can't get out. One goes left, the other one got to go with them. But what happens when two are going in opposite directions? Nothing gets done. Marriage is a yoke. Deep, intimate friendships is a yoke. Soul ties are a yoke. No, just because you like somebody with friends. I mean, I got a whole bunch of unsaved people. I love them with everything I got. We can talk, have coffee, work out, do all those things. But when it comes to the intimate spiritual things of my life, that's where we separate. No, it's not because I'm better than they are. It's because we're going in two different directions. And either you're going to pull me or I'm going to pull you, but somebody pulling somebody. And if you don't think somebody's pulling somebody, you're out of your mind. 
Some of y'all in the dating world, that's why the Bible never I advocates dating. Because in dating, you build a bond, turn into a soul tie, and somebody going to pull somebody. And some of y'all foolish people say, well, I'm praying for him, and I'm going to draw him into the church. You ain't drawing him in nowhere. Because you already compromising yourself, and you ain't, can't even tell him nothing. Come on, somebody. I ain't talking judgmental. I'm talking because I've been there. No, God gonna fill her with the Holy Ghost. I'm believing God. Going, I just love her, and God gonna give me. He said He'll give me the desires of His heart. Not when you playing the fool. You cannot be yoked. You got people that have good friendships. You can't share your spiritual needs and concerns with somebody who can't relate. So, when the Bible says, "Be not unequally yoked to unbelievers." For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? Can y'all allow me to teach a little bit this morning? Fellowship comes from the word, the Greek word metoshe, which means really about participation, being together. When I say being together, that close-knit participation. See, my unsaved friends, I can't go to the club with you. I can't go hang out at the bar with you. That's what you do. If you making me go, then you ain't my friend. You're not respecting that. Just like if you unsaved, I'm going to invite you to church. I ain't going to make you go. <laughs> I'm going to invite you. you always welcome. So he says, what fellowship does righteousness and unrighteousness have together? What do they have in common? Nothing. And then he uses another word. Communion. He says, what communion hath light with darkness? If y'all know anything about physics, they can't exist in the same space. If light shows up, darkness has to go, no matter how little the light is. Y'all know the song, this little light of mine, what you gonna do with it? Let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, even in my school. I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Once light shows up, darkness has to go. So there is no relationship you can be yoked in where we can hang out together. Let me just tell somebody, just because, listen, the biggest mistake you can ever make is you marry somebody unsaved. And if you unsaved, don't marry somebody saved. It ain't going to make you better. <laughs> I'm going to find me a godly woman. You a godly man? No, I'm just going to find a woman that lives right. Worst mistake you ever made, brother. Because she half crazy for marrying you in the first place. Love will not fix it. I promise you. Love will not fix it. But that yoke is what is damaging the church today. Because now we don't know the difference between holy and unholy. Because now you can just be saved and do anything you want to. Because grace covers it. Uh-oh. This is where I said this is for the church. Yeah, let me just pace myself as I get there because y'all might just drive off now. But the yoke, he says, what fellowship has light with darkness? And he says, and on what, and what accord has Christ with Belial? Now, you might ask him, who is Belial? Belial is a nickname for Satan. And the name actually means worthless. Belial means worthless, a worthless devil. See, many of us are spiritually tied up because we're connected to something that's worthless. You're trying to bring worth out of something that's worthless. Now, when I talk about people, people are not worthless, but your relationship with them can be worthless. Do I have to say that again? No person is worthless, but the relationship can be worthless. Have you ever just been with somebody over a period of time and just said, I'm not getting nothing out of this relationship? You ever have somebody just sap all the life and energy and strength out of you because all they do is drain? That's a worthless relationship. I don't know about you. There's people that call me and the only reason they called is because they're in need of something. Amen. I look at my phone. And, I, I, and them two big circles. The green one says accept and the red one says reject. 
And if I reject it, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> if I just decline the call, I'm going to be happy because this does nothing for me. Y'all have to understand sometime when relationships don't do anything for you, there are people that attach yoke to your life and they're doing nothing but dragging you down. You used to be on fire for God and now you're not. You used to be excited about ministry. Now you're not. You used to be excited about prayer and now you're not because something is yoked to you. So he says, what concord has Christ with Belial and what part is he that believeth with an infidel? See, in the modern church today, they're telling us we need to be open and accepting of everyone. True. We need to make room for all different types of people. True. But we make room for them for salvation, not for relationship. I will open up my arms to anyone that is in need of Christ. But there is a boundary. Uh oh. Can we talk about the boundaries? Amen. See, the problem with some of us is that we don't actually make boundaries. Boundaries can be a beautiful thing. We have them on our property. If you have a home that you own, a surveyor came out and created boundaries, property lines. You pay for it before you buy the house. Draw them property lines so I know when you own my property. Some of us got fences. Some of us live in the country. We just got open air, open air boundaries. But you know when somebody's on your property. Me and my neighbors don't have a fence, but we know the boundary by the grass. And every once in a while, he'd be creeping over, creeping over. He cut one more row of grass. You, you cut my grass because there's really a boundary. Church, we got to go back to a church that has boundaries. There's certain boundaries we just don't cross. You are welcome on my grass. You are not welcome in my house. Grass is kind of, okay, walk across my grass. I ain't going to have a big fit. Rather you not, but if you walk across it, I ain't going to pull my Glock out because you're walking on my grass. But you walk through the front door, there might be a problem. Let's, let, let's go back to the word of God. Because he says, in what agreement in verse 16 hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell with them and walk with them and will be their God and they will be my people. So there is a promise that comes with God when we separate. You cannot please God and be in the world at the same time. When you separate, God said, he said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's a promise. But you cannot enjoy this promise still connected in the boundaries of hell. So that's why he says, Paul says to the church of Corinth, come out from among them. You're mad. You're offended. You're bothered because you're with them. Separate yourself. I hope y'all know I'm preaching this message to me as well as I'm preaching it to you. There has to be some things that change within us, church. We cannot operate like the world and expect the blessings of God. There ain't going to be a lot of amens today. I'm cool with it. But look what he says. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. That word separate in the Greek, it means to separate by boundaries. As a child of God, you have to make up in your mind that there's certain things you don't do, certain things you don't say, certain places you don't go. There's certain things that these are my boundaries. Back in the day, we just called it holiness. Oh, okay. I'm going there. I grew up where saints don't drink. Well, is it all right if I have a glass of wine? Why are you asking? Why do you want to do something that is not your norm to do? Because just because it might be allowable doesn't mean you should do it. 
Everybody in the church is now trying to find the rule behind the rule. Oh, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say we can't do it. Jesus right one in the Bible. But look, Jesus didn't grow up in America. Jesus didn't grow up in Lockport. We separate ourselves. We don't do certain things. Well, no one's going to hell for smoking cigarettes. Yeah, you just might get there quicker. It's not about dude. It's about being separate. Every wheat is not a sin. The Bible says, lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset you. There's some things you shouldn't do, and it's not a sin. If you're addicted to shooting pool and you shoot pool on Sunday, Monday, all through the week, and that's all you think about, you probably shouldn't shoot pool anymore. Pool ain't wrong. Your obsession with it is wrong. So when you separate yourself, you separate yourself from anything that can come between you and your relationship with God. So is it all right for me to go out and maybe have a glass of wine every once in a while? Nah, it's not going to put me in hell, but it's going to put me closer. Because I ain't fully delivered. Uh-oh. I still got tastes and appetites on the inside of me that have been put to sleep that cannot afford to be awakened. Or I can't get no help. There's some things, you know, in my teenage years, I messed with some substances and different substances and stuff. And, you know, I was walking through the mall with my family the other day and just the cloud of weed hit me in the face. I remember that smell. Yeah. Come on, some of y'all act like y'all forgot. I remember that smell. Yeah, like Woo! That. <laughs> brought back memories, brought back thoughts. Now your pastor ain't about to go. But, I, but what I'm saying is you can't afford to open up appetites. Y'all brothers know y'all like small waists and big thighs. That's why you got to keep your eyes to yourself. Walking down the street, you should just be like, Lord, help my mind. Just let me just look at the ground. Jesus, like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's not, that's not weakness. That's intelligence. When you're called to separate yourself, you separate yourself from anything that can trip you up. Because in these last days, I can't afford to trip. Because have you noticed the older you get or the bigger you get, falls hurt worse? Yeah. Yeah. When you was young, you could trip, fall, slide, slip, and it wasn't a bother. I ain't going to tell y'all, but <laughs> I was walking my dog last year, and it was a little bit of wet and mud. And I slipped all the way on my back, 6.30 in the morning. I just laid there. I had to call my wife. I just slipped. My whole body went into shock because I'm older now. You just don't get up from a fall. Come on, somebody. You know, you don't, when you fall, you, how many old people, they fail. It takes six months to recover. Uh -huh. That's right. The worst thing that can happen to an old person is to fall. Yeah. But it's the same thing spiritually. The older and mature you get in God, you can't afford to fall. Hallelujah. How you going to be 80 years old thinking about backslide? <laughs> you got people that are old. What been walking with God for years? People been in the church for years, and you thinking about experimenting with certain things? I thought about going skiing 10 years ago. I changed my mind. Looks fun, but I can't afford to fall. There because see, church people are getting comfortable falling because they think, you know, if I make a mistake, I can go to the altar and repent. I can tell God, me and God will high five and it'll be over. But the more falls you make, the more difficult it is to get up. And then one time you go make a fall and you go just be comfortable down there and say, you know what? I'm tired of getting up. I will stay right here. But if you're hanging with people that are standing, you feel more comfortable standing. But if you hanging with people that's laying down, you're going to feel comfortable laying down. That's why he says, come out from among them and be separate. Well, what if people talk about me? What if people, so what? They were talking about you before. 
This is my eternal soul I'm dealing with. This is my life. If you're not comfortable with my walk with God, then maybe we shouldn't walk together. There are people that are not comfortable with your walk with God. Y'all had family members. They're not comfortable with your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not your business. Got children. They ain't comfortable. Mom, you always got to be in church. Da, da, da. You always got to be hitting us with the Bible. Well, don't come over my house. <laughs> you know, like sometimes we even have to tell people, well, I don't even feel comfortable doing things at my home. I know some of y'all got some standards. Ain't nobody lighting up no cigarette in your house. No, Ain't nobody, you know, you, you know, Ma, can we bring some beers over the house? No, you can't. Not in this house. Because you set a boundary. That's right. And in your personal life, you have to set certain boundaries. You know, I, I believe in a, a sense of freedom. I'm not a person that's tied up in church legalism and everything. But there should be some Holy Ghost boundaries you have in your life. That's right. Ladies, just because you can wear it doesn't mean you should. I'm going to look at the wall. Just because you can fit into something don't mean you should try to fit in. And that's brothers too. Just because we, there's no law preventing us. There should be the boundary of the Holy Ghost that tells you, mm -mm, don't do it. You know, when you're thinking about something, whether you should do it or not, those boundaries... Just ask yourself, would I do it in front of my Christ? Yeah, that's right. that's it. If you and Jesus went to Applebee's, are you comfortable ordering a Budweiser? You and Jesus go to Olive Garden, are you comfortable ordering a glass of red wine? If you're not, then don't do it. Set that as a boundary. No, I don't believe I'll go to hell if I have a glass of wine. But why do I need it? Why do I want to do it? Church, the word of the Lord is telling us that if we want to experience the certain pleasure of walking with God, God walking with us, being in fellowship with God, we're going to have to separate. That's what the old church understood that the new church doesn't. They called themselves, saint, but before Pentecostal and apostolic and all these organizations, People just call themselves sanctified or holy. What type of church you go to? Holiness church. Didn't even have no name. It's just a, some of y'all grew up. What's that? That's the holiness church down the street. Holiness is still the way to separate ourselves. That doesn't make us weird or strange. It just makes us separate. We don't do what everybody else does. Do you know that people in professions live different lives? You know, like take your doctor. They don't live like everybody else. They work crazy hours. They got crazy discipline. If you're doing 630 surgery in the morning, you ain't going to be out partying until 2 a.m. They live a certain life. When you have the call of God on your life, you have to live separate from everyone else. There's a lot of time I wish, you know, Saturday night and go out and hang out and go to movies late and do all those things. But, you know, my calling requires separation. So people of God, I just want to admonish you this morning. There is, you can live successfully separate. Last verse I'm going to say, and we're going to wrap this up and we're going to give a call to the altar. In chapter 7, verse 1, Paul sums it up by saying, having therefore these promises, what promises? To walk with you, to dwell with you, and to be with you. He said, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does he mean by that? We have to cleanse ourselves both bodily, in our flesh, and in our spirit, man. You know, just because you live moral doesn't mean you have a pure heart. Because you cannot drink, not smoke, not fornicate, not commit adultery, and still be a wicked person. So there has to be a cleansing of the flesh and of the spirit. Is there anything in you? Like I, I said something the other week. I got people that speak in tongues who don't speak to me. And I don't know how that works. That you feel the Holy Ghost shouting in the aisles, but you can't speak to me. See me in the store and go the other way. And then I go down the other way so I keep running into you. That means maybe your flesh 
is clean, but your spirit is nasty. So holiness means not just a cleaning of your behavior, but a cleaning of the heart. When David committed adultery, he said in Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Because if I had a right spirit, I might not have slept with that man's wife. Some of our behavior is attributed to we have a foul spirit. Oh, come on, somebody. If you clean your spirit, you can clean your whole act up. So he says that cleanse ourselves from the filth of flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What is perfecting holiness? Perfecting that separation. See, as long as I'm in the world doing the things of the world, I can't reach the world. You can never reach the world being like the world. Because let me just tell you something. People want to see a difference between holy and unholy, clean and un. They need to see a difference. And that's what the early church was. They saw a difference. That's what people wanted to be a part of it because they saw people loving one another. They saw, you know, different races, colors, classes of people coming together in the power of God. And people say, this is wonderful. They're different. But now we're like everybody else. There's certain things that shouldn't even be named among us. Look at all the scandals and stuff that's happening in the church. And I'm not being judgmental, but why are we having all this? I'm tired of seeing certain preachers up every nine months on YouTube apologizing and repenting. Either sit down or get saved. Because we grew up in an age. See, I don't know how old some of y'all are, and I know how so some. We grew up in an age. You sat people down. You sit your butt down somewhere. You get off the choir and you get yourself right with God. You get out the pulpit and you get yourself right with God. I'm not against that. And maybe in my youth and my ministry, I let some stuff. We'll pray about it. We'll talk. But sometimes that don't help nobody. But correction and holiness is still right. Because at the end of the age, I want to see you make it to heaven. I want to see you live at peace with God. Yeah, that message was for the church. But for those of you that might be listening to my voice now, and you might be asking the question, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, first, you got to understand why you're lost. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of how you were born. The Bible says we were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity. And we were born because we were born without a relationship with God. When Adam sinned, a curse came upon mankind where we took on his sin. We took on his nature. And through 42 generations, we lived under law, you know, trying, going back to the tabernacle of the temple to be cleansed of our sins. And we were never really clean. We were just covered. It's called an atonement. But God himself came in human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he took on himself what we could not do for ourselves. So he took his sin, our sins in his flesh, died on a cross. Our sins died with him, but he rose again. And because of his resurrection, we have life. If there is no resurrection, this is a giant waste of time. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then church is a waste of time and God is not real. But because Jesus rose from the dead, we have new life through Jesus Christ. And if we believe in the message of the gospel, in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, by faith we can be saved. What does that say? What does that mean, Pastor Sanders, to be saved? The question was asked to the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. What shall we do? Peter said, repent. Repent means to change your mind. Well, I thought it was an apology. God don't, ain't looking for no apology. He's looking for a changed heart because a changed heart leads to changed behavior. A lot of people try to change their behavior without changing their heart, and that's not repentance. That's morality. 
But repentance is when you change your heart about your sins, confess your sins, and you are forgiven in rep and then to be baptized. Does it matter how I baptize? Absolutely. There was only one way in the New Testament church in which men and women were baptized. They were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. It is through that baptism that we identify with Christ and our sins are forgiven. And he said, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is the gift of the Holy Ghost? When Jesus left, Jesus said in the book of John, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send you a comforter in my name. I'm going to send that comforter is actually a person. It is the spirit of Jesus Christ that he sent back here to dwell in us. So if we repent and we believe on Jesus Christ, he will send his spirit to live on the inside of you. Oh, God. That's biblical salvation. And when he sends his spirit to dwell in you, he will also speak out of you. That's salvation. If you are lost, if you do not know Jesus Christ, that is how we know him. All you have to do is believe. Jesus says, if you believe in me, as the scriptures say, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. If I'm going to ask everybody to stand, if you can, just we're almost ready to go home. Just stand if you can. If you're here and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to come. You can come right up to here. I would be I would love to pray for you, pray with you, or maybe you had a walk with God.